Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Poland Daily Travel, this time on a beautiful Saturday morning in the Polish countryside near the village of Wyżna. Wyżna is an important name uh, for the beginning of the Second World War. It was here that 700 Poles with a handful of officers and half a dozen artillery pieces were able to uh, hold off a much larger German force under the famous tank commander Guderian as they were invading this part of Poland. Uh, it was already early in the war, but of course they had invaded from, from East Prussia, which is not far away. In fact, this area right where we're standing on the beautiful Narev River as we continue our journey, this area was uh, back and forth under Prussian, Russian, German, Russian control, even at this point. Eventually the battle was lost, the Germans lost, uh, the, uh, the Poles lost the battle. Um, their commander eventually committed suicide by throwing himself on a grenade rather than surrender. Who knows what he would have been susceptible to. There were all kinds of threats made to the soldiers because the Germans were infuriated that they were able to hold out and hold up their advance. Because at this particular time, the uh, Germans had made the, the uh, Robbentrop-Molotov deal. And uh, uh, this, uh, they had agreed its spheres of influence in Poland. And this eventually, though the Germans won their battle here, coming down from Prussia, it's a fish jumping, though they had won their battle, uh, they did hand over this area to to the Russians. Isn't that nice when your country is being handed over and juggled about between two other countries? Does it remind you of anything else that we're uh, seeing, uh, seeing today? So Wiesna, W-I-Z or Z-N-A, Wiesna, that's where we are. It's, a, it's just a tiny, a tiny village today. In medieval times, it was important. It was on the road between Lithuania and Krakow. This is the church in Vizna, and it's well worth coming to see in any of these small towns. Where you want to stop is the church, the cemetery, the old fortress, the river, all of these kind of places, if there is a river, these kind of places so you get an idea of what's going on. And uh, there's, there's an, some notes here that tell you the church was built in 1300. That was when it was started. And the town itself goes back to, although you wouldn't know it to look around, it goes back to, to 1,000, the mid-1,000. So I think it said 1,037. So that's quite a long time. And uh, it's strange. You, you come to these, to these medieval towns in Poland, and so many of them have been destroyed, you see, uh, over time. Um, various wars. Are, You've had the Swedish through here, you've had the Russians through here multiple, multiple times, the Prussians, the Germans, and clash after clash, not to, mean cl not to mention clashes between uh, uh, various nobles who were of Polish extraction and Lithuanians as well fighting with the Poles. So all of these things have happened and it leads to these towns where it's very hard to find the history. You have to go to the churches, you have to go to the cemeteries. In fact, for example, let me give you a great example. The whole Jewish history of this particular town is gone. Okay, there's no, it was once a, a large population of Jewish people here. The cemetery, uh, gone. The, uh, the synagogue is gone. So, but this is what you do have. This is particularly interesting because this must have been um, one of the early, an early chapel. This is obviously quite old. You've got the Romanesque. See, here we've got Gothic pointed arches, and here you have the Romanesque, and you've got this patched up door. And I'm just guessing, but it looks pretty old. Very special place today. We're at uh, Gora Strankova. Gora Strankova. It's a hill. Gora means hill in Polish. As you can see behind me, we have the uh, Bierbja National Park stretching out the biggest national park in Poland, stretching out in that direction. Uh, farms and forest, 
for miles and miles and kilometers and kilometers. And you can see where we're standing is a kind of a butte. And this is where the last stand was made of Polish soldiers led by Vladislav Raginis, a uh, Latvian-born minor aristocrat uh, who found himself here in the center of the defensive line in the Battle of Vizna from the 7th to the 10th of September in 1939. That was when the Germans invaded Poland. There was a force of only, at the most, 700 men in this area. Some people say it was much less, but let's go with 700. It's interesting who was in opposition. In opposition to them was the great general tank general Guderian, the German general, with about, with a number of tanks and about 40,000 men by conservative estimates. So it's 40,000 to 700. And they were protected by, as I just showed you, this countryside. Let's go have a look at it again. This countryside, there's a high hill. This is more like a, I would call it more of a butte it's more of a butte than a, than a hill, and I'll show you why. Um, because it tapers down on the other side. But here, you're sure, certainly very, very well descended by this steep uh, embankment. It'd be very hard to clamber up with equipment and make you easy to get knocked off. Out here is where you had the Germans. You had tanks, an enormous amount of men, all stretched out across this area. Now. The other thing you have to remember is that this particular position, the Visna area, uh, was in between, that's W-I-Z-N-A, or Z-N-A, Visna. The W is pronounced like a, a V. So you can look it up and read about it, it's fascinating. You had uh, this nine kilometer area, which was the Visna area, which was under the defense of this captain, Reginus, as I told you. And his idea was to stop, or his orders were to stop the encirclement of the larger Polish army. They're, that's in between two rivers here. We have the Bierbja River, which runs through the park and up north to Sawałki, sorry, to Augustów, and uh, the uh, Narev River, which runs from uh, runs from uh, Białowieża uh, forest all the way up in front of Białystok and this, this is where we are now. Right now we're, in, we're actually in between those two significant rivers. Now, um, what I can tell you as well is this is a remnant of one of the bunkers. And you can see it's been quite destroyed. There were a number of these on the hill and this is where those soldiers resisted the bombardment. This is the last existing one. Here's a plaque remembering uh, Vladislav Reginis and his soldiers and other officers. And that's, that's what happened. Later, interestingly, you see, the tanks charged up, were, were able to charge up, drive up this rather uh, inviting slope. It's, it's not very steep at all, especially in a tank, but they still weren't able to, to, to get all the way up here. There were several, they had half a dozen uh, howitzers, which I suppose could get, do some damage to a tank. Plus they could, they were uh, no doubt able to uh, use other kinds of anti-tank weapons. But you wonder why, perhaps the main force wasn't committed and that's why they weren't able to take this particular area with the tanks for three days. Guderian later, because he survived the war, he was interviewed at Nuremberg, and according to what I read, uh, they asked him, uh, and he also wrote about this episode and praised the Polish defense in his book uh, about the war. But they asked him what took so long, he said, well, you know, they, they defended well, but also we were building bridges and we had a lot of other logistical problems. And so uh, 
you know, we didn't throw our full force against them. As to how many Germans died, the Polish side says up to a thousand. Um, all of the Poles were wiped out except for a handful, a few dozen. And uh, uh, the Germans, the, the German staff says that, that only really uh, a handful of their soldiers died. Of course, they wouldn't want to admit, would they? Certainly not back then that they could lose to Poles. They never did admit that in any of the, in any of the fights they had with the Poles.